when people, when I meet people for the first time, they come and ask me, are you Filipino? And one of the things I have to answer them is, first of all, yes, I am Filipino. Although I did not grow up here, I lived in Indonesia for almost 20 years. And um, this is a bit of a struggle because I, being away for that long, it was difficult to me to understand what it really was to be a Filipino. Similarly, I also grew up studying at the Jakarta International School, and I knew about other people's culture, history, and language more than, a, than my own. So for me to understand what it truly was to be a Filipino, I first maybe had to look at my roots or retrace my path through my own family. This was my first real memory of the Philippines on a summer visit with my family in Malacanang Palace. This was me, an historic building, and we were there for a historic moment, not just for our family, but I believe for the country as well. This was the day my grandfather, Nestor Alampay, was inaugurated into the Supreme Court um, system, uh, not just once, but twice. The first time was, of course, under President Marcos, and the second time was when he helped overthrow Marcos um, as being the first Supreme Court justice to resign during the People Power Revolution, and here he is now being reinstated into the Supreme Court again. <laughs> So this was what history was for me. It was about connecting myself with places and time that I could relate with. The same thing goes for field trips. This was one of my most memorable field trips in Indonesia. This was in uh, Yogyakarta at the Borobudur Temple. So this was, it, it, history for me was going beyond the textbooks about memorizing dates, names, people, and events where I couldn't relate to them, but really touching and feeling the, the atmosphere and being there firsthand is what history was for me. We're lucky today to have great documentaries. These are my <laughs> happen to be my three favorite channels right now, where we can now reconnect and understand a bit of our past through these great production value uh, documentaries that you see. As we all know, we just around our corner, uh, the back, our backyard, is where we have our Manila walking tours, which many of you have, may have tried. So we also have our uh, food tours, where we can connect, try to connect with our history through food, which we all love. And we can now cruise in the streets of Intramuros on a bike with a tour guide and understand it from a different perspective. So the popularity of these, to of these um, tours just explain that we are all yearning, we are all searching for something new and different perspective to learn about our history and our past. We all know that we all have little, these little tools in our pocket called tablets or iPhones or uh, Samsung phones. We can now connect now with our history and integrate that with technology. So we have now ways to connect uh, with technology and art through these interesting exhibits, which we have recently seen. All right. So, unfortunately, the things that we visit today and the places we experience now may not be there tomorrow. And whether you know it or not, it's a fact that we are losing our heritage sites faster than we can restore them. We lose them through urban development, through neglect, uh, poor maintenance, um, wars, as we see now in Syria, and we lose them to um, natural calamities like earthquakes and typhoons, right? Just last year, we saw this headline. It's called the September Massacre of Manila's Heritage, where we lost three historic buildings all in one month due to demolition. We lost Admiral Hotel in Ross Boulevard, the Army Navy Club, and Michelle Apartments because they were now going to be converted into new hotels or new condominiums. So these buildings actually held historic events, held um, housed historic uh, figures in our past, but somehow they did not sur they survived the war, but they, we did, they did not survive the demolition that just happened last year. Another day we will never forget is the 2013 earthquake, which is, uh, holds its two-year anniversary almost uh, next week. So during this earthquake, we lost countless, or I think not just lives, we also lost at least a dozen heritage structures, churches particularly, that were brought down to complete rubble. So somehow when we lose these sites, we somehow lose a bit of our identity, I believe, because just the way that France is known, uh, they have their Eiffel Tower, New York has the Statue of Liberty, Egypt have their, has their pyramids, the Philippines, we all know that we are identified by the symbol and, and of our faith, which is our churches. So somehow losing a little bit of our, our churches, we lose a little bit of our own identity. So what does this have to do with what I do and my passion? About 10 years ago, uh, our family and I, we put together a small business that involved architecture and engineering support services. 
Um, that involved, we wanted to make that, take that a step further by seeing how what we do can help the country and other countries and, and come together and see how the nation can help uh, be supported by technology. And that technology is what we call 3D laser scanning, which we introduced to the country a few years ago. Right? So this technology works this way. It's a device that fires a laser rapidly at around 1 million points per second. And anything that the laser touches, it returns that point as a 3D point in a 3D space. So this is now used in a lot of uh, complex environments that needs to be measured, such as industrial plants, facilities, roads, bridges, highways, uh, as well as used in crime scene investigation. But that's for another, another story. <laughs> it's now being recognized and widely used for documenting our complex and beautiful heritage sites around the world. In this example, in 2012, we took this uh, technology into the Manila Cathedral, which was undergoing then a restoration program because it was found to be uh, structural, uh, there were some, some structural defects and some things that needed to be addressed, such as cracks. So we needed to go in there and document everything that we could from this laser scanning system. So as I said, it spins rapidly and anything that it touches returns as a, as a point and it uh, captures millions and millions of points. And when you put those points in those locations where we scan from together, that becomes a consolidated 3D model. But it's, not, it's like digitizing a, an entire space, like a photocopier, except capturing the entire environment. So after putting all that data together, we can now understand a full 3D model, actual 3D model of the, of the church, of the cathedral. And now from here, any virtual anything that you can measure can be done through this, through this uh, consolidated data. And we have a team now that's in the office that does extraction of this information to make sure that we have basically blueprints or reverse engineering of those plans. So as I mentioned, it moves from one spot to the next, from corner to corner, and they overlap from one point to the next. And as I mentioned, it reaches up to 300 meters. So from the ground, we can actually capture the bell tower, the roof structure, uh, the streets, the utilities, everything around its space. And from there, this is what the raw data looks like. It looks like an image. But the image is not just an image that's this, but it's measurable. Everything you see here, you can take virtual measurements, reach up and, and on your digital data. And you don't have to send out guys on scaffolds, climb up and, and take point-to-point -point measurements and say, I forgot a point here. Everything is now captured in this 3D space. So this is what it looks like initially, the raw data on the left. And when we sweep to the right, that's what the drawings look like. And what we show next is the actual output. So this is how much detail we can capture from the laser scan data. And all those things, all those lines, all those statues, they tell a story on its own. So it's important to document everything as accurate as possible because each of those stones tell a story. This is interesting. This is the Fort Bonifacio historic war tunnel. Many of you who go to the fort or work there or hang out, you might pass this every day without even not realizing it. The entrance is just there in front of Market Market. And if I take you down, deep down underground, you'll see what the tunnel looks like in actuality. So this tunnel was, um, ex was dug out by General MacArthur in 1941 and uh, during the Japanese-American War. And it was built as a command center to alert the troops when the Japanese were coming in. Unfortunately, it was never used to that uh, point because the Japanese arrived, the Japanese troops arrived before it was completed, and the Japanese took over the tunnel and expanded it even further, over a kilometer long. So what did we do in there? We went down there, and this is actually the actual tunnel, as you see. This is something you'll see if you go down there, but you don't have to go down there now because we scanned it, and it's unsafe, and it's pitch black. So we can understand now from the scan, <laughs> we can understand the, the areas built by the Americans, which was now reinforced by concrete. And we can now take you a pull-out view and understand the different chambers, compartments that were used for map, that were supposed to be used for map rooms, uh, storage, hospitals. And then now spin that around and take you through the Japanese. So this is now the Japanese area that was dug out, which expanded the tunnels, even smaller chambers spread out further. But then again, it, gives, it tells you the whole story of, of that whole, the war. The war. And so why did, we do, why did we scan this? Why did, why did the group get us to scan it? Because this eventually, in a year or two, will be turned into a historic war museum. So imagine all the data that we gathered here is now going to be analyzed and brought into engineering drawings so we can now understand the structural stability, how safe is it, how do we plan out the use of this in um, construction, and understand the, how to design it for public use and safety. So hopefully in a year from now, we will we'll see this come to fruition. 
This is one of my favorite churches actually in the Philippines. Um, this is the San Sebastian Basilica, which is the only steel structure in the country. This, there are only a handful of these now in the, in, around the world, but we are lucky, such a lucky, so happy to have this here. This is the first one of the first churches we scanned, and um, it was completed in 19, uh, 1891. And if you go there today, it's going, undergoing a 10-year restoration program. But if you go there today, it's almost as original as it was when it was constructed. In this, in this delivery of the 3D scan, we are now analyzing millimeter by millimeter all the surfaces that, of this elevation and understand how the, stressing are, how the stress is happening on the columns by the red color. So that shows you the stress points based on millimeter accurate records and helps the structural engineer understand how to address this concern before anything happens to this treasure that we have. This next few images show you the destruction that happened in Bohol. So we were working now with the National Museum to document and understand what happened in the earth earthquake. Why are, still, why are buildings some, some, why are some still standing? Why are some completely collapsed? And what do we do now with these structures? You know, they're completely damaged, cracks all over. So this allowed us to bring together a team of experts, engineers, restoration architects, researchers, to understand what happened before the earthquake so we can understand how to address it and how to rebuild it for the future. So before we can understand really fully what how to restore it, we still need, we need to first go back in time, understand that these structures actually showed signs of wear and tear already through typhoons, through earthquakes, through poor maintenance that were not addressed. Cracks were already happening prior to the earthquake. So the earthquake was really just a wake-up call for all of us. It was a tipping point for us to understand we need to address the problems that were not you know, seen before, but helps us understand. We first need to go back in time, understand it, so we can know how to address the future and restore it. The same thing from that study, we are now taking all the different types of damages that we see and categorizing them so we can now analyze it, put it together, and now quantify the damage and understand it holistically so we can now understand possibly how much effort, how much time, and how much money will be needed to restore these structures to its original state. This example is the South Korean Namdae Moon Temple. One of the most prized heritage sites of South Korea dates back to the 14th century. A sad day in 2008 happened where this structure was burnt down by an arsonist. A crazy person ran up there and burnt it down. And since the roof structure is almost completely made of wood, not even 360 firefighters could put it out. Several months before this, however, it was digitized through 3D laser scanning technology. Of course, with this data, we can now extract all the different measurements, components that build up the structure. And if you go there now today, you'll actually see a fully reopened structure as of May 2013. So this just shows how important it is to document our heritage, to understand, to give it its best chance to be rebuilt and maintain and stand the test of time. So how does this all relate to what we're doing now? Technology is there, but we can now use this in apps. Education, help us understand a bit more of our history through apps, which we carry in our pockets every day. We can now integrate this into lesson plans. You know, this is an interesting image. This is a, 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 not really a fabricated image, but more on helping us understand that education can help, can help connect um, to other countries and help people understand about who we are as a country and make their own connections, right? We can even connect this to our tourism industry. So this is the Miyagao Church in Iloilo, and we can now understand, look how much detail and artistry went into this. So by seeing it this way, a different perspective, it'll help our local and foreign tourists want to touch and feel this for themselves. And I think this is just enticed to help our tourism industry, seeing how much work went into this. So as, as, as you know by now, this is, you can see the, the passion I have for not just the technology, but seeing how this technology can you know, bring us to another level, help us understand our past, to help us understand how, what steps we need to take for the future. My plan is hopefully to make this technology more accessible to government, to education, all over the country, so we can virtually scan and document all our heritage sites down to ancestral homes. Eventually, you know, um, that's, that's the plan, but um, with everyone's help, hopefully we can reach that goal. And I'd like to leave you with just one more thought, which is, he who does not know how to look back at where he came from will never get to his destination. So, with that said, you know, documenting our history, retracing our past, and really um, documenting our heritage sites the way they should. You know, paths that were once less traveled will somehow be more accessible for the future generations, and hopefully will all help us understand what it truly means to be Filipino.